Oregon recruiting hitting major bumps in the road. I still see a top 10 class. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks, which is why if you have not already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. Make every moment more as playoffs wind down. The sports stop sporting like we want them to, but this summer FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Last coming up on today's show, Dylan Gabriel, Bo Nix talk. A question came in that is interesting to say the least. And live interview from Terrence Ferguson, my time at Big Ten Media Days last week. That will air later on today's show, and I will react to it because it is a, a really, really good interview. T Ferg, incredibly, incredibly nice guy and a fun one to talk to as well. But the news over the weekend, not great for Oregon on the recruiting trail, which is crazy because I was told that Oregon is incapable of having bad recruiting news because they have an unlimited NIL budget and they're just buying all the players and every player that wants to be bought just goes to Oregon and every player wants to be bought and all they ever do is go to Oregon and that's the only thing that ever happens now on the recruiting trails. Oregon just, uh, you know, buys kids. So if, if that's the case, by the way, for all those people, coaches, players, fans, media, whoever, pushing that particular narrative, uh, does that mean that Texas is also uh, privy to a, an unlimited limited NIL collective is Tennessee also funding unlimited NIL is it a major it, yeah if you can't sense the sarcasm you haven't been here long enough or I haven't laid it on thick enough because uh, these are significant bumps for Oregon in the 2025 recruiting class make no mistake about it the reason that I expect Oregon is still land a top 10 class is because they're currently sitting 10th nationally, according to the 24 seven sports composite rankings. That's the first reason. And the second reason I expect them to land several more recruits, one of whom at least could very well be a five star. You look at a guy like Trey McNutt, they could flip Naeem Offer from Ohio State, they could get Michael Terry, who I'll talk about in just a moment. But if you missed the news over the weekend, the two D commitments were uh, 20. Now, there was also a 2026 commitment. We'll talk about him later in the week. But the more pressing matters in the recruiting sense are in 2025. Four-star tight end uh, Deshaun Brame and four-star defensive line Josiah Sharma. So Brame is a guy out of the state of Kansas. He committed to Oregon when d the Ducks were kind of getting down to you know him and Lincoln Cure in this 2025 class. They ended up with Brame, loved his film, liked his tape, but then there were reports that Tennessee had stayed in his recruitment, that they were making a really hard push, and they ended up flipping him away from the Ducks. So Oregon now lacks a tight end commit in the class of 2025. And other than Michael Terry the third. There aren't really any options. So Terry is an athlete, five-star guy, uh, one of, depending on which service you look at, the top athletes in the 2025 class, and he can play legitimately four different spots. Tight end is an option. So I wonder if this makes him Oregon's highest priority recruiting target, given that they don't currently have a tight end in the class. And yes, they, they have you know two tight ends in this 2024 freshman class. Teakferg, you, you'll hear from him later in today's show, talked about uh, Roger Saliapaga, said that he's doing a great job in, in his first season, which is good to hear. But going an entire recruiting class without one position group, without at least one player from any position group, I think is strange to say the least I, I don't expect that to be the case and I also think the the efforts ratchet up for Terry because the number of tight end transfers available that are high level guys not readily available you know Casey Kelly last year was a depth piece he was the number three tight end but big time tight ends rarely transfer I don't know why it's just kind of the way the transfer portal cycles have gone the last couple of years so I, I think that's how that recruitment sort of goes. Now, Josiah Sharma was a part of that big blitz for Oregon around the 4th of July when they landed DeCorey and Moore, they had landed Dorian Brew, they got Sharma, and there were a lot of surprise commitments. I mean, all of those, frankly, were, were surprising at some level, depending on who you ask. And Sharma was one of the more surprising ones of that bunch. 
because Texas was seen as the leader and Oregon was seen as third, and now he's flipped to Texas. And look, this is somewhat standard operating procedure in the recruiting class. Oregon's had decommitments in this cycle. I can't guarantee you there won't be more. I don't expect there to be more than maybe one more kid that would flip away, but Oregon has flipped kids before. When Dante Moore flipped to UCLA, they flipped Austin Novosad from Baylor. It's just the way the game is played. You can flip. You can be flipped upon. And Oregon's been flipped upon here. And, I mean, their their recruiting rankings have gone from 5th down to 10th. Like, these are significant deductions from a ranking standpoint. They're also deductions from a player standpoint. So in the first two recruiting classes that Oregon uh, has had under Dan Lanning, the first two uh, full cycles, they've recruited the defensive line very heavily. Right now, Oregon's 2025 class is down to just 14 verbal commits. And I have not seen, read, or heard uh, any rumors that anybody else is, you know, thinking about flipping away. But you look at this class and look, Nasir Wyatt could play at at the edge position. I think that's where he's best suited to play, but might be a pure second level linebacker. They've got Matthew Johnson, a four-star edge player. They don't have an interior defensive lineman right now. And that's kind of the role that Sharma was you know, going to plays, be that first guy in the interior, you know, beefing up the trenches and such. We haven't seen that. And, and Oregon has recruited this position. You know, Dan Lanning uh, answered my, my question at Big Ten Media Days last week when I asked about the defensive line because they're replacing a lot for this 2024 team. And he went straight to how they've recruited that position over the last couple of years. They've done exceptionally well in the portal and with high school recruiting. So maybe there's less of an emphasis along the defensive line because they have stacked those classes and they feel like those guys are going to stick around and they can get high-end transfers. You know, you think down the line after this year, Oregon's going to lose three of their four starting defensive linemen, Jamari Caldwell, Derek Harmon, and uh, Jordan Birch. I don't expect any of them to be uh, on the roster next year. I mean, a couple of them. Yeah, and I think Harmon could have, Har- Harmon might have a COVID year uh, at tossed in there, but, you know, th- those guys might get replaced with transfers, might get replaced with with young up-and-coming players who we see play along the defensive line. But it is a light class in the trenches so far for Oregon on both sides of the ball. I'd expect that to change at least a little bit going forward. But because of the strength of the last two classes, maybe it doesn't. Maybe this is just a a lighter offensive and defensive line class because they don't feel like they're going to to have a bunch of kids transfer out uh, in, in the trenches where they've recruited well over over the last couple of years. So uh, yeah, de- definitely some some bumps in the road here. There was uh, a, a conversation, I had it on uh, this very show, about whether Oregon could uh, potentially land the number one class in 2025. I think losing these guys and falling down to 10th at this point in the cycle probably removes that possibility. Could they launch themselves back into the top five? Yeah, it, you know, Brian Smith, our Locked On Recruiting Insider, who I'll definitely talk to later this week, says all the time, you know, it, it just takes one or two kids to move up significantly. Ohio State has been recruiting really well, though. Uh, so, too, have Alabama and Georgia. Shocker, I know. So Oregon kind of falling out and losing a little bit of that uh, recruiting heater that they were on during the summer. I think it probably takes that out of a realistic possibility unless they are able to flip a guy like offered from Ohio state. I think getting him and Terry would probably be a require a baseline requirement to get back in that sort of range. But I think if Oregon pushes for a top five class again, Dan Lanning and company are living up to the billing on the recruiting trail. But I think they're still in a good position to be a top 10 class. Once again, that's what I expect Oregon recruiting to be with Dan Lanning and his staffs year in and year out. That's the standard that they've set. That's the standard Oregon fans uh, should expect on the trail. But yeah, bumpy weekend in in recruiting. I'm not going to come on here and, and sugarcoat and say, everything's fine. It's great. Like, no, I, a, a Brame especially, like Sharma as well, but Brame especially was a guy I was hoping Oregon would keep. Hopefully they're, 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 they're going to be able to land Michael Terry the third. Drop your thoughts in the YouTube comments or hit me up on X, formerly known on Twitter. I want to hear your thoughts. One of you sent me a thought about Dylan Gabriel and uh, Bo Nix. Curious to break down the numbers here as both transferred to Oregon. That's coming up next. First, though, we're talking about Ibotta. Sandals, sunscreen, snacks for the kids. 
What do these things have in common? You're probably buying a ton of them again this summer, but don't stress about the cost. Use Abata and get cash back on all of your purchases when you stock up on all your summer essentials. Abata is a free app that lets you earn cash back every time you shop. You earn on hundreds of items from groceries to beauty supplies, even toys. So you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing, which is a big priority for a lot of people nowadays. The average Abata user earns $256 per year. That could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip, that flight you've been eyeing, or the fancy dinner you have been craving. It's time you joined over 50 million users who use Abata to earn cash back every time you shop right now. Abata is offering our listeners just $5 for trying Abata by using the code Locked On College when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store, download the free Abata app to start earning cash back and use code Locked On College. That's I B O T T A in the Google Play or App Store, App Store and use that code Locked On College. This episode also brought to you by our friends over at Factor. Warmer, sunnier days are calling. Fuel up for them with factors. No prep, no mess meals. I'm a big food prep guy. Big food prep guy. And factor is the exact sort of business that I really need. Because throughout the week during broadcast season, I got to do shows. I got to interview coaches. I got to do play-by-play. I don't have time to cook all the time. I wish I did because I really enjoy cooking, but Factor makes it easier. Meet your wellness goals in time for summer thanks to the menu of chef-crafted meals with options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. So no matter how busy you are, like me, more busy, less busy, everywhere in between, you always have time to enjoy nutritious, great tasting meals. They've got 35 different meals, more than 60 add ons. Go check them out. Head to factormeals.com slash locked on college 50. Use code locked on college 50 50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code locked on college 50 at factormeals.com slash locked on college 50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. Go check out Factor today. Back in the great state of Oregon with an Oregonian second segment sip. Oregon water, by the way, better than every other water anywhere. Washington, a close second. Every other tap water, I will not drink it. I'm curious if all of you agree with me on that. Let me know genuinely curious because that is a big point of discussion in my life as I go around the country and meet all sorts of different people. So it's mailbag time. YouTube comments, X formerly known as Twitter, or if you want priority access, you can go join the flock over at subtext link in the description below, wherever you listen to or watch this show you can get a free 14 day trial. See if you like it. If not, no voluntary commitment whatsoever, but you get priority access. You get my instant reactions to all the breaking news and analysis and whatnot all sorts of perks. You can go join the flock over there. One of you sent me this question about the quarterback position, an often discussed subject on this show because some would say, some, it's the most important position in all sports. Maybe, possibly. This one starts with MBC slash Q, mailbag comment question. Nice. Nice. Love the acronym. Please give us a side-by-side stats comparison between Bo and Dylan heading into each of their final seasons and outline how they compare and what Dylan needs to achieve this year to equal or eclipse Bo in the major stat categories, please and thank you. So I think this is uh, an interesting angle to be sure. I'm going to tweak it real quick and then I will answer specifically what you're looking for. So uh, just to lay out the stats, and I will uh, do some comparisons uh, in, in in a moment here. Oregon in 2022, when Bo Nix transferred in, elevated his game significantly. He completed 72% of his passes, just under 3,600 yards in 13 games, 29 touchdowns, 7 picks. You compare that to Dylan Gabriel, who last year at Oklahoma in 12 games... 3,660 yards, just under 70% completion, 30 touchdowns, six interceptions. Gabriel also ran for 373 yards and 12 touchdowns. And Bo Nix in that 2022 season with the Ducks ran for 510 yards and 14 touchdowns. So a lot of similarities there between those two particular numbers. I think the better season to compare and contrast is what Bo Nix did before he got to Oregon and what he did after he got to Oregon. 
because Dylan Gabriel last year had a good team around him. The team that he had around him at Oklahoma was better than what Bo Nix had at Auburn. He had better receivers, a better offensive line. He had a better coach as well. Brent Venables is still the head coach at Oklahoma. He just got extended by the Sooners. Brian Harson, meanwhile, is not Auburn's coach. There's a difference there. There's a reason. So coaching matters. What you have around you absolutely matters. But in Bo's last year at Auburn, before transferring to Oregon, he was just under 2,300 yards passing. He only played 10 games. Gabriel is still averaging far more yards per game than Bo was that year. In 10 games, he threw for just 11 touchdowns and three picks. He had 168 total rushing yards and four touchdowns. It was not overly impressive even when he was on the field. His best season was, uh, I think, his freshman year in 2019 while at Auburn, and he completed just under 58% of his passes, but Auburn went 9-3. and three. So, you know, he, he popped big time when he got to Oregon. Gabriel is going to have his most productive season as a college quarterback, and he is encroaching upon several records, career starts, career passing yards. He can push for all of that at Oregon this season. The wide receiving core that Gabriel has this year compared to a year ago, it is a jump up, right? If Oregon's receiving core this year is, let's call it a 9 out of 10 and save 10 out of 10 for, you know, that Ohio State room that had three first round uh, receivers on it at one point in time or four of them or Washington's receiving core, LSU's receiving core from 2019. Like those are 10 out of 10 wide receiver rooms. Oregon's at about a 9 going into this year, which I think is the highest it's probably ever been i mean last year very very similar because you have a lot of the same guys you swap out troy franklin for evan stewart they're different but more experienced for the other dudes like you know you can make that argument however you'd like he is getting a better wide receiver room but the 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 array of pass catchers that bo Nix went from having at auburn where he had like one guy really that they could throw the ball to and not a great running game to one of the best offensive lines in the country, an elite running game, and a good receiving core. That's a significant step up. So for Gabriel going into this year, it's a smaller step up. I think he's going from a wide receiver room that featured guys like Nick Anderson and Drake Stoops that was maybe like a seven and a half or an eight. Or if you want to do a Dave Portnoy pizza reviews, it's like a seven, eight. It's a good, it's a good core. It's a good core. I think that that step up is there. I think the offensive line is going to be very good. Their offensive line in Oklahoma last year was also good. They're replacing a bunch of them this year because they all graduated uh, and they were they, they were super experienced. So I think Gabriel, uh, also because of the games played factor, is going to have his first career 4,000-yard season. Does he throw 40 touchdowns? Mm. Ah, gosh, that can come down to so many different things. Like when you get into the red zone, uh, that depends. 40, touch, 40 touchdowns is a lot. That, that, that's a lot for a quarterback, especially on a team that does truly strive to be balanced. Like Bo Nix had, had 45 last year, which set an Oregon record. Uh, if you throw in the extra game, and that, and that was in 14 games, by the way. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, forty. Like, I, I, I struggle to come on and say, yeah, Gabriel's going to go up there and and set a new record. But uh, I, I think that that comparison is just more apt rather than what Bo had. You know, uh, compare comparing what Bo had at Oregon twenty twenty two before the twenty three season. I think it's more appropriate to think about in the context of what he had at Oklahoma and what he now has coming to Oregon because there is an upgrade. So. You know, at some point, I'll, I'll, I'll do a, a statistical prediction for, for what Gabriel's season ends up looking like. But in the 4,000-yard range, 100% expect that to be the case. Does he run for almost 400 yards and 12 touchdowns? Mm, mm, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you, you look at what, what Bo Nix did with Kenny Dillingham in 22, 500 yards rushing, 14 touchdowns. With Will Stein... 234 and six. I think Will Stein wants to have his guys play in the pocket uh, a, a little bit more. So uh, I'd expect the rushing numbers to come down a hair. But I think the passing numbers, I do think they uh, they, they, they definitely go up. I, I think to get to that particular level, 
what what Gabriel has to do is number one, stay healthy. Right? He's had injuries in his career. He's going to have a good offensive line. I think to to have that sort of season that could allow him to push to be a Heisman finalist, he's got to stay healthy, number one. If he does that, I, I, don't, I don't know how that doesn't come to fruition. Great team, great coaches, great receiving core, great offensive line, sixth year of college football, off the best season of his career. Everything kind of lines up. It, it, it kind of lines up. And that that's really the only reservation I'd have about you know, what would stop Dylan Gabriel from getting to that level of, of clearly demonstrating what I have, you know, felt all offseason and continue to think that he's the best quarterback in the Big Ten. There is no other quarterback in the conference that I would rather have going into this year. There might be other quarterbacks in the country. It's a small list, but in the Big Ten, no, not particularly close. So, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, I think that staying healthy is is really the is really the only thing because you know it seems from uh, from all the comments that Landing gave last week he puts in the time to connect with his receivers and the team and his coaches and, and everything that you want to hear about a quarterback there standard operating procedure great I think that's awesome if he then goes out and plays behind that offensive line with two NFL caliber tackles and a really promising young center in poncho and an experienced left guard and experienced right guard. Yeah. 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 He should be, he should be really, really good. So uh, I don't, I don't think there's anything that, you know, I see from him on, on film or that I've heard people talk about with him about, Oh, he's got to do this or he needs to do that. Like, no, he just kind of needs to be himself. If you, if you are yourself, like Bo Nix was the same guy. You just gave him better support system. And it was drastically different. This one is going to be different, just not drastically different because Oklahoma was a good team last year. So, love the question. Uh, the person who sent that question in did not get your name down. Subtext doesn't do names. That's okay. We can just chat all the, all the time. As everybody over there knows, talk with me one-on-one -on -one pretty frequently. There were two other takes that you sent in. We're going to save that for uh, later in the week. Maybe even tomorrow's show, perhaps. But I had the chance last week to catch up with Terrence Ferguson at Big Ten Media Days. I thought he was great. He's an incredibly nice guy. We're getting to that interview and the big takeaway that I had from it. That's coming up next. FanDuel's coming up first, though. I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games and the sports aren't sportsing like I want them to. FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime that I'm in the mood, which is really, really neat flexibility just like you can consume this podcast anytime you like and i appreciate you whenever you choose to do that this summer fanduel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily that's right there's something for everyone every day all summer long oregon's win totals over there the ohio state game the michigan game the washington game everything you want sometimes it's fun to just poke around just go look see what betting lines look like oh they're favored by this oh they're favored by that what stands out to you it's a good time. Go check them out. Head over to FanDuel.com. Start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel.com is where you need to go. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. I caught up with Terrence Ferguson last week. We'll hear from Jeffrey Basso later this week as well in that interview because I like what Jeff had to say. But T-Ferg had some pretty bold statements, and it was also just a fun chat. Here's what that sounded like. Terrence, talk about the, the tight end room this year and also the evolution of that room over the years since you first got to Oregon when you were a true freshman all the way back in 2021. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's been a, a crazy transition, honestly. Uh, we started off with a lot of older dudes who were still playing football or, or other places. Um, and it's really transformed. We have guys that have stayed like me and Pat. Um, and now we have a young guy like Kenyon and uh, Roger who are doing great jobs and really excite me and Patrick because um, we're building a legacy of Oregon tight ends. There's already been a good uh, legacy of that with some guys like Ed Dixon, uh, the Wilcox. The, there's a lot There's a lot of people that have been um, great Oregon tight ends, and we're just excited because the guys below us are more talented than we are. So um, when they get that chance to be on the field and uh, represent the Oregon tight end room, uh, we're just super excited because they're is in great hands. So. It's really transformed, and um, this is probably 
one of the best rooms I've been a part of tight end room wise. Um, Pat is playing the best football he's played. And then Kenyon, when he touches the ball, it's going to be electric. And uh, I can't wait for people to see that because he deserves all the credit in the world. He's probably the best athlete on the team. And then a young guy like Rogers coming in and working really hard. Um, we have a lot of depth and a lot of players that can make plays. Patrick Herbert over the last couple of years has you know, kind of been the, the number two tight end right behind you. You said that you feel like he's playing the best football uh, of his career. What do you feel like he's elevating going into this season? Mm -hmm. I think he's elevating almost everything. You know, I think he had his injuries and um, it kind of, you got to get back from that. It takes a while. It takes a while before you get comfortable and uh, you get back to your normal self. Um, but he's running way better routes than he's ever ran. He's blocking the best he has. Um, and really, he might be overshadowed because of uh, me, but that's not rightfully so, because he's a, a great athlete and he can go start for almost any program in the nation. Uh, he's an elite tight end and he does a lot of elite things, um, blocking, catching the ball and everything in between. So I'm really excited for him because he does deserve a lot of credit. You were seen as a potential NFL draft prospect after this year and will be after this season, all likelihood as well. But you made the decision to come back to Oregon for your fourth year mm -hmm. off of a first team all Pac-12 season. I, I think some people might have thought, you know, it's the right moment to kind of capitalize on that momentum, go to the NFL draft. Why did you come back to Oregon? You know, I came back, I, I wanted, that's my dream was to go to the NFL. It was right in front of me. Um, I prayed about it and it really was put on my heart to come back to Oregon. Um, I feel like I have a lot of unfinished business um, with winning. Uh, I went to Oregon. I figured out to win a Pac-12 championship. haven't done that. Um, and I want to be in contention with the national championship. Uh, that would be the first one in Oregon history. And I want my name in that, in that column with uh, everybody else. So all the guys that came back, we all kind of packed together and said we're going to come back. And that's how you win games. You have a lot of veteran guys come back, a lot of transfers uh, that all have that same goal. Uh, it's something I want to do. I'm super competitive, so I want to go win a national championship. And uh, it's not a bad place to go back to. You know, <laughs> Oregon does it right. Um, I love the coaches. Love all my teammates. And I'm beyond blessed to even have the opportunity to make that decision. Um, so I decided to come back. You know, to win. You talked about Kenyon Sadiq, and you know, you, you said that he's more talented than, than you or, or Patrick Herbert. And certainly, he does things on the field that most tight ends can't do. For this season, though, what, what do you see his role being uh, in, in your guys' room? Yeah, no, I think he's going to have a role this year even. Um, I think we're just going to try and get him the ball any way we can. That's handoffs, whatever way he can touch the ball. Uh, I told some people he might even kick the ball. Just <laughs> he's that good of an athlete. Um, when he touches the ball, special things happen. I've seen him hurdle people standing up. I've seen him run by anybody, and he never gets tackled by the first person. Um, so I'm super excited for him because – I think he's going to get a little taste of that this year, and I think some people are going to open their eyes when, wow, that kid touches the ball. It's it's special. Have you played the new EA College Football 25 football game I have, yet? I have, I have. Have you thrown the ball to yourself 10 times in a game yet, or uh, what was yeah, your first probably, experience? Probably more than 10 times <laughs> in a game. I've, lo I've lost some games to my brothers because uh, I just force-feed myself the ball um, <laughs> to a fault. I go. I have great statistics, but uh, probably thrown a couple interceptions on Dylan's part. Uh, trying to force feed me the ball but have you played against dylan yet uh no we we kind of mess around in the little hospitality lounge um, but i haven't really played against him <laughs> but it's just surreal man it's such a blessing to be a part of that what are you most looking forward to this season you know i'm just looking forward to being able to play with my brothers one more time um, it's kind of like the last little hurrah guys like jeff who me and him have been through a lot together um, some other guys who stuck it out and then just new guys um who have been able to get really close with in the short amount of time that they've been there. I think that's really just my last little bit of college football. I'm excited to go out in a great way. Awesome. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. His praise for Kenyon Sadiq filled me with joy because ever since he was recruited to Oregon and committed to Oregon, I have been the self-appointed president of the Kenyon Sadiq fan club. And I'm not the only person in the club. I'm just appointing myself to that particular role. I won in a landslide election running on a post with a one to nothing vote victory. How about that? So I think that Sadiq is, is so unique. Oh, gosh. I didn't mean to do that. I did not mean to do that. Kenyon Sadiq is a very special football player. 
in that he is able to do so many different things for your offense that other tight ends just can't. I, I mean, you, you look at his athletic profile and he was already, he already proved that he's capable of blocking a, a year ago, at least at, at the college level for a true freshman, did a solid job. Uh, you can throw him fade routes in the end zone. That's just not something a lot of Oregon receivers have been able to say over the years, but he, he can do that. You get him the ball in the open space. Yeah, you can run. You, you line him up in the backfield. You can run him in the flat, or you just hand him the football, let him run. This is kind of the modern tight end. You know, the Kyle Pitts, the Brock Bowers types, and I think it's great for Oregon to to have that sort of guy and, and to hear him say, you know, he could be better than all of us. My eyes lit up like you can't see me there because I'm behind the camera asking him questions, but my eyes lit up and, and I went into full blown uh, think about what could be in 2025. I love what Oregon can be in 2024, but I'm always thinking down the road as well. It's just kind of in my in my nature at this point. But I think his upward potential is really, really high. It is all conference. It is NFL caliber stuff. He'll have a bigger role this year, but. Oregon needs to keep him around and let him know you're the number one guy for 2025. Because T. Ferg, sure, he's just being humble. T. Ferg is an NFL guy himself. He's very tall. He's very, <laughs> he's, now I'm very short, so that contributes to it. But, you know, Bossa and Gabriel were there. They're, you know, bigger than me, of course. T. Ferg is very, very tall. He, look, he looks he looks the part. That's an NFL guy. And for him to say Sadiq could be better than all of us, that is some really, really high praise. And I think athletically, he has the potential as well. Let me know your thoughts in the YouTube comments. we got so much to get to this week. The season's hilariously close. In the best sense, it is so incredibly close. We're like one month away from Oregon football. Cannot wait. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.